Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mike Saikuda. I'm the Executive Director of FRI at the University of Missouri. FRI um, is a research institute at the University of Missouri that is focused on bringing together regulators, industry, consumer advocates to discuss, debate, and learn from one another about issues affecting the various industries that, that we cover, electricity, natural gas, and water and wastewater systems. Our program today is on dealing with lead and copper service line replacement. We're glad that you joined us. Um, I, I want to introduce our moderator for this afternoon and we'll jump into the program. Uh, the rules for engagement today as we go through the webinar is as you have questions, if you would add those to the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see that, click the three dots on the right and the Q&A should pop up. If you can put your questions there, we will try and answer them as we go through the webinar and have a little bit of Q&A time at the end. Uh, this is being recorded and we will hang it up on our YouTube channel at fri.mizzou. And it'll also be on our website, fri.missouri.edu. So you can follow up with it after as well. So with that, Karen, I would let uh, our moderator today is Karen Stokowski. Karen is Deputy Attorney General in the uh, Office of the Attorney General for the State of Tennessee and works in the Consumer Advocate Division. Uh, she's a member of the FRI board and is chair of the Nusuka Staff Water or the Nusuka Water Committee. Uh, so she brings a lot of perspective to this and we're glad she's with us. Karen, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the rest. All right. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, the University of Missouri Financial Research Institute for hosting uh, this hot topic hotline. Uh, seminar. Um, I always think water is the best topic to discuss. I find it not the most fascinating, but then I am a Nisica Water Committee Chair, so maybe I'm a bit biased. But how we're going to proceed is uh, we're going to do quick, quick self-introductions uh, so you can kind of see the name and face as they speak, and we're going to then go into the discussion. But we're going to start with uh, Commissioner Bange. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael, Commissioner Michael Bange uh, from the state of New Jersey for the Board of Public Utilities. Dr. Crockett. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Crockett. I'm the Chief Environmental Safety and Sustainability Officer for Essential Utilities, which includes Aqua America and People's Natural Gas. We serve uh, water and natural gas to over 5 million customers in eight states of which uh, on the drinking water side, we have over 1,500 water systems. And Mr. Matthew Pine. Hello, Matt Pine here. I uh, want to just point out that I'm sitting in the backyard of Purdue University. Uh, since we just finished up March, I thought that was appropriate. So no no shout out to, or, or fault to Missouri, but I uh, just want to give our team here in uh, Indiana uh, kudos. <laughs> Indiana American Water President, I've uh, been here with the company about 10 years. We serve about a fifth of the state. Uh, about 330,000 water connections across the state, and obviously West Lafayette being one of our 50 communities. So excited to be on the panel today, and thanks for the opportunity to be a part of. All right. Um, when I when I left the state environmental agency and came over to the uh, consumer advocate division in the attorney general's office, um, I know we were already talking about uh, lead service line replacements, and the discussion then was. Should it be full replacement or partial replacement? And so why are we still talking about lead and copper service line replacements right now? Uh, well, I'll, I can start with that um, okay. real briefly. Uh, you know, we've all, lead is a very toxic substance, right? It, it can have a lot of effects on adults that have effects on your kidneys and, and other things, including cardiovascular effects. But for children, uh, it can have developmental effects. It can actually lower the IQ of children. And for pregnant women, it can actually have impacts on fetus birth weight. So there's a lot of things we've known for a long time that lead is very toxic. But lead has also been universally used in a lot of products uh, throughout, throughout history. And, you know, it was in gasoline. That's been cleaned up and removed. We know the lead levels are reduced in the air. It was uh, in a lot of uh, paint, and that's been banned. 
and now most of the paint that's in lead in people's homes is actually usually sealed in or mediated or getting there. And so the last frontier of lead exposure left at the individual level, at the home level, is actually in your plumbing. And the two places typically are either the service line that leads from the main in the street into your house, which could be all lead or partially lead, or the solder in your home. So, uh, and this has been a practice for a long time. If you go to Pompeii, uh, which was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius, and you see the ruins, you will actually see lead service lines running into the homes. So this is not a new concept, uh, but it's been around for a long time. So remove, this is really the last frontier or, or last big source of lead in the home or near the home that we can work on removing. And so regulations have been in place since 1996 aimed at addressing lead, but this is kind of the last big piece to be done. Michael? I have a question. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I didn't know if Mike will add uh, anything in addition, Commissioner Banch, anything in addition to add. Sure. So, you know, because of the, you know, uh, EPA regulations that have come about and the legislative re regulations that have come, it's time for us now to all water companies to get their inventory list together and create a plan, uh, communicate that to the public, to their customers, and to put a plan together to remove the lead and galvanized services to their homes. So that's the next phase of it. You have uh, here in New Jersey, uh, you have till the year 24 this year coming up now to put your list together and we have to 2037 to do the full replacements. That's what's currently in place right now. But the biggest, biggest thing I have to say is outreach, uh, very important to get it out to the customers and, and get that data uh, list together. So I would think that a lot of consumer consumers would believe that the utility companies know, at least on their side, and they probably think within their home, uh, they would know what the lead if they had lead service lines. And you you would think so, Karen. But I'll, I'll take that and uh, say that you know our records aren't or was not the greatest. I'll, I'll say my past experience at American Water, um, you know. As you grew the business, we we took over different towns and their records wasn't all the greatest either. So we kind of put that together. We came out with a some GIS mapping and try to do the best we had with the paper uh, aspects or tap cards, we used to call them. Unfortunately, they weren't the best. And also uh, the water companies owned from the main in the street to the curb. There's a shuttle valve at everyone's curb. That was the owner of by the water company from the shutoff valve to inside the home was the customer homeowners uh, line. So obviously we only had what records that the water company showed. And, you know, we try to take and look at what material was used to kind of figure out what the homeowner could have on their side. So that's where we currently are at. Yeah, and commissioner, uh, pr probably not completely fair. Obviously you spent some time with our team, uh, with our New Jersey, uh, program in Indiana, American Water obviously was a state that was identified very early as having one of the highest concentrations of lead services. When you think about Chicago area and north, northwest Indiana, Gary, uh, Sherville, Sher uh, uh, Crown Point, other communities that we serve, either water or we own the, the utility system, uh, we found that because of the plumbers guild in the area for that period of time, really prefer. Uh, lead, I, you know, what we obviously, uh, the doctor talked about some of the ill health effects, but for many decades, millennia, as we heard uh, with Vesuvius, you know, lead was a preferred material of choice. It was easily formed. It, it you know, it was uh, anti-corrosive. It didn't go away very fast. So it was a good product from that perspective. But certainly as, as human science proved that there was ill health effects and being able to get it out. So that inventory and, and the commissioner kind of hit out on New Jersey is really where that first step back in what I'll call 2018, 19, 20, all these companies really needed to be diving into initial those cards, those records that he, that he indicated with some of those acquisitions. But that's really where the beginning steps were. And, and as we know, with the new rule and the, the lead and copper rule, as it states today, we have to do a full inventory. We have to now know what that customer's uh, uh, asset is. So we're going to be doing a lot of identification 
And I know New Jersey, they work with uh, the customers to go out and take pictures and send them in so we can at least start uh, crowdsourcing some of that information. And then, of course, the cost of then hiring a contractor or an employee to go out and uh, pothole all those uh, services is going to be an immense part of what I'll call that kind of continuum to compliance. You've got inventory, public outreach, and I know we're going to talk about it today. Education is so critical throughout that process. Working with your schools. I know a lot of states, Indiana being one, that uh, did early testing. And that's going to be ongoing under the lead and copper rule. And then, of course, updating the customers as you go through that, because you can't just fix all these services at one, uh, one event, one activity. It's going to take years. And there's, frankly, uh, you know, utilities out there, as you indicated earlier, that really haven't even started. And so a lot more progress is going to be made in the coming years uh, to make sure that the lead is taken out of our water systems. So you, you talked about um, customers being part of determining, you know, whether they have lead service lines. What exactly are they doing to help? Well, uh, one, uh, these services terminate in the home. And so as a result of that, they may be able to go to their basement or, or, or some uh, portion of their house and be able to see what that pipe is. Now, that's not a definitive rule. We've seen where that pipe may be uh, a different type, galvanized or something else, and then it's lead as it comes out of the home. So it's not uh, a directive that you know absolutely know, but at least gives you some instructive uh, information. And so the customers are providing that to us, and then our teams are allowed able to go out and do some further investigation, at least start to narrow the scope of where we need to make investment to replace lead services. And of course, there's some modeling that can be done. Homes that were installed after a certain date, uh, we know that different types of materials were being used. So we know we don't have to go in. Now that's even it's said, uh, not always the case too. We've heard from some other companies, I think uh, maybe someone on this call, even as we prep for it, uh, there's areas of this country where inventory of materials existed beyond kind of what local um, permitting was allowing as far as the material choice at the time. So. So can anyone explain what was a good, what's been a good a, a state that's been doing well and doing it early? So I'll um, take that. Um, yeah. When I was formerly at New Jersey American Water, uh, I kind of kicked off the program, I want to say three, four years ago in my area. So I had 24 towns in my district that I was responsible for, uh, 650,000 customers. So basically what we did is we, we started with one town, which was a very old town, and we knew that we had a lot of services there. So we worked through it. Um, I want to say, you know, our best thing we did, I, I would have to say, was the pothole. And we were able to do a, a dig at the curb to determine what the company side had and also what the customer side had. Um, and, you know, we had some contract pricing for that. But there we had a definite knowledge of what was on both sides for the service line. Um, and then from that, um, you know, we got signatures from the homeowners to get permission to do the work on their side, obviously. And then we were able to replace 4,000 service lines um, during that time period. And we just continue that project into the next town and next town after that. Um, and it's still ongoing. Like I said, I've left there and uh, I'm out of there about a little over a year now, and the projects are still continuing to, to grow there. Yeah, and I'll add, obviously, Indiana American and all of American water states were looking at their inventories and, and identifying what was the regulatory path, um, what was the customer education path. And, you know, knowing we had so many in Indiana, we, we worked with the General Assembly back in 2017 to pass state law that allowed for the commission to, mm -hmm. to rule on a program to review what a utility might do to be able to benefit both the customer and obviously get the lead out of the systems. And they approved in 2018, our lead service line replacement program. Um, and in Indiana alone, just for Indiana American water customers, we've invested over a hundred million dollars. We've replaced over 56% of our lead services. I'll say that's known services. We have many that are unknown that we're going to have to validate under the new rule. Um, and then obviously a lot more work done. And we've also been obligated as a part of that program to look for federal uh, dollars. Uh, we, we received our first $6 million forgivable loan this year through the SRF funds, as well as about a $12 million low interest or zero interest loan uh, to make sure that uh, as we do these investments, we're keeping things affordable as we can for our customers. So do you think you'll be able to meet the EPA deadline of having your inventory completed with your system? 
Indiana does. Uh, I, <laughs> I think all of American Water is pretty confident in it. A lot of work to be done in the months and years ahead, but uh, uh, we're very confident in being able to do that. So. And you've been doing it for a few years, though. And I think there's going to be some reality checks on that. I, yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, private utilities may be able to pull that off in three years. Uh, and, you know, there are going to be some access issues. There are customers that will uh, not sign access agreements. And then you have to go the route of shutoffs and things like that uh, if you're allowed to under the law in that state. Uh, if you can't, uh, there will be uh, somewhere you're going to have to use statistics and modeling and and you know, but 99.99%, I think, will get there. I do think there's going to be some utilities that just are not going to be able to get the work done, and uh, it's going to be uh, a, a lift for folks, uh, especially some of the big cities that have a lot of lines, and a lot of unknowns. Uh, I think it's going to take them a long time, a little longer than three years to get done. So we, I mentioned full or partial replacement. And it kind of makes me think about what's the utility's responsibility line-wise and what's the consumer's. Do consumers have a, an appreciation for that or is it something that you really have to explain to them? And then if you explain it to them, is there a program to help people pay for that cost? I could kind of speak to that on our end. For New Jersey, we, um, you know, we had the low-income loans and everything to, to do that work. Uh, they finally came to the water companies, finally came to the board and the board approved recovery on that service work um, through the rate payer case, you know, so the rates would increase to offset the cost of this work. Now, you're talking could be, you know, an average service could be somewhere around 7,000 all the way up to about 37,000. And that's a full replacement. That's the company side and the homeowner side. And the biggest things that we're seeing there cost-wise is, the, you know, the permits, restoration, um, and a lot of the issues that we're running to is getting in access agreements to get into the home to do the work. And basically with what we have in place right now is we make three attempts. Um, if we can't get in, it, it's formulated on the list, and we're going to send that to DEP and, and let them know that we've done everything we can possibly to, uh, to get into that home to make that service replaceable, so. Have you found local governments really open to trying to streamline the permitting process so it can get done? Well, what we found is that, you know, we communicated with the local towns, went to council meetings, explained the whole process, what's going on, but the townships kind of took it as, well, this is a good time for us to get permitting money in, so they're, they up cost their permits, they raised the amount of dollars that it costs for the permit, some towns did permits required behind curb, which in the past we only had road opening permits. Now we're gonna get into a behind curb permit. Um, and then obviously, you know, when they see us doing all this work on a road, now they're gonna come back and they've come back and said, well, you know, we want you to pave that road now after you're done with all your work. So cost has been driven up by, by these factors. And one thing we, we tried to focus on, especially in the early years of our program was really going after our our lead services that were long existing water main that was due to be replaced. It was at the end of its useful life. And so we knew we were going to have mobilized crews along that entire street. We knew we were already going to do significant restoration. Um, and so we, we went in, replaced the main, did the tie-ins uh, with the new services, and then moved on down the line. I think we're in a phase now where we're starting to see you know, that main is actually probably still pretty good. Maybe it's only 30, 40 years old. Uh, and if, if for those that don't know, water main, we hope will last somewhere around 80 to 100 years. We don't always get it that long, but that's the goal. Um, and so that being said, it's not prudent to, to replace the water main, but we do have to get the lead out. So we're doing a lot of streets that have good mains that now need all the services changed over. And I think to, to the commissioner's point, it's about communication with that customer. And, and Chris, you made the comment earlier about access we are kind of getting to a point where customers may not want the utility to come onto their property. And so Indiana just passed law this session, and I know other states are evaluating it, that would require uh, uh, both the utility to go onto the property, but also the homeowner to give access so that, that service can be replaced. Because at some point down the road, there's going to be a disclosure requirement. 
you know, we're already seeing it with the EPA requirements for lead and copper that this is in fact going to have to be notified as, if you have lead in the in the system. And at some point that's going to impact property values, that's going to impact home sales, and you know, perhaps be a disclosure requirement like radon or other things that you're obligated to do when you when you sell a, an asset. What we're seeing, in, in, especially in Northwest Indiana, is the investment to replace the lead services is, is in, in embedding an economic interesting item where uh, developers or property owners might want to come in and, and invest in buying that property. And, and unfortunately, we've got a number that are on tax sale, things of that nature. But they see, hey, the utility is putting in that infrastructure. We're going to go ahead and uh, buy that asset, fix it up, and then turn it uh, into a, a property that the community can be proud of. So that's an interesting, unexpected item, uh, specifically in some of our more economically distressed areas. So we just had someone bring up in the um, in the Q and A, and they were asking about well, you, you can eliminate the service lines between the main and the street and the meter and up to the meter in someone's house, but what about the fixtures? Because you're still going to have lead. What is what's going on there? Is there a program to address that with people? Yeah, actually, the fixtures uh, as as you replace your fixtures. Uh, there's a requirement for fixtures to be lead free that are sold in the United States. And it typically means like 0.25% lead. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you replace, if you go out and replace your sink or faucet, uh, your faucet, you're going to get basically what's considered lead free. There may be some, a, a tiny fraction of leaded brass, but it's also going to be much more amenable to the corrosion control uh, compared to uh, lead service line and, of course, the surface area lead service line and the disturbances that it's vulnerable to. The remaining lead is really going to be if your house is pre-1990 lead tin solder. And again, if the water company is doing a good job with their corrosion chemistry, uh, you shouldn't really be having a problem with lead tin solder in your home. Uh, it's really these, uh, the service lines create the greatest vulnerability for the greatest mass. Um, but it's all about making the the, the most improvement for the best buck there. And again, over time, as people replace their fixtures and faucets, that risk from the brass and the older faucets would be. One thing, uh, Karen, we could just recommend to the customers and people in general would be, you know, when you get up in the morning and uh, before you take a drink of water, you know, open up that faucet, let that water run because if it's sitting overnight or if it's sitting for days, if you're away on vacation, you know, there's no movement of water. So, that, you know, you could get a, a higher reading of lead in that. So we just recommend that you just run that faucet for a few minutes and, you know, you get a clear, clear bill of health on that. Someone mentioned the concern that replacing pipes in the house can be seven to 10 times the cost of replacing a service line. Is, is that kind of what you guys know is the... I would, have, I would have to agree with that because, you know, you're ripping up walls to get lines through. And if, especially if you have a multi-unit home or two floors, you're running pipes through that. And then you're replacing, you're taking tile showers out to change the plumbing behind there. It's, yeah, it can be very, very costly. But to what Chris said, if there's a good corrosion control plan from the company, the water company, you'll be fine. Um, you know what I'm saying? The main thing is, Let's get those service lines done on both sides and then go from there. And I, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll notice a difference. Yeah, there's absolutely uh, an ongoing, you know, I think customer concern, you know, the, the average individual out there is reading about this in the news and they're going to be concerned about their in-home plumbing. And, and I think that's, you know, that one, a very different conversation, obviously in this scenario with lead services, the utilities are generally best equipped to go in and replace the entirety of that line. One, it, 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 it frees the consumer up, hopefully, to start addressing some of those interior fixtures or their interior plumbing as they can. I think one thing that the federal government uh, or other levels of government are going to have to think about is, is there an incentive program, just like we've incentivized, you know, geothermal and other investments in properties? Is there an opportunity here to create tax code or uh, incentive programs to get the consumer and or the investor in that property to, to remove that interior plumbing and, and get new assets in place? We can only do so much as the utility partner. Uh, but we want to continue to educate uh, that customer. And I think to that end, you know, for us, even with our lead service line program, uh, we are, you know, trying to build consumer confidence as we go through this. And we get a lot of questions where we do town meetings. We are doing a filter program as we're doing the lead services. 
just to make sure that the consumer has the confidence in that first six months or so after the replacement to make sure that there's there's not been a concern uh, from a water quality perspective. Long term, it's got to be a, a lot of players, a lot of partners, community and, and at the national level talking about how we get the interior plumbing replaced over time. So right now we're dealing with service line period, educating the, custom, the consumers about their household plumbing and fixtures. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, like we said, we're figure out identifying, replacing, and then educating and hopefully a government program will come in and help with the, the removal within the house of plumbing. Hopefully. That's what incentive program, as you said. So we've been talking about cost. Um, Commissioner Bange, what's the role of the commission regarding the cost of all this well, work? Now, obviously, the, the, the water companies, utilities have come to us and asked for uh, recovery on this work, and, it, and it's costly. So. Um, it has come to us and we have approved a rate increase for the water companies to get recovery back on these uh, replacements. Um, you know, to put this on a homeowner uh, to do the full replacement, is, it's just an out. Extremely amount of money to, to do this kind of work. But I guess to me, it's you're sharing the cost If everybody gets a little piece of it and it's a small increase on your water bill. I think it's it's easier swallowed, if you understand what I'm saying there, mm -hmm. as far as getting a big shot all at, one, all at one time. I don't think we could all afford a big uh, bill in the mail for service work. So if we share it amongst all the customers and it's a small raise over a two or three year period, I think it's more valuable that way. So Matt and Chris, um being the utility, are there federal funds out there um, that I, may, I know there's the SRF, um, but what about the you know the Infrastructure Act? Is that something separate from the SRF, or is that is that provided through the SRF programs? It, Go ahead, Chris. I'll, I'll jump in, and Matt can jump, join in. It, you know, the, the the Biden infrastructure law money, as well as money dedicated for lead, typically depending on the state, it does flow through the SRF programs in that state. Typically, um, there may be some specific set aside somewhere, but that's typically with the majority of this, the federal money to the state, uh, to the local government. That's usually where most of the money uh, is located. Uh, Matt, I'll let you comment. Yeah, and, and I think we've we've been advocating for you know federal programs uh, for a number of years. Obviously, we started our investment in 2018. Um, many years before, but under, under our lead service line replacement program, 2018. And uh, as a part of our law, we are required to go after federal grants and loans if it can have an impact on the, the affordability of the program. And, and we've done so. Uh, and as, as I mentioned earlier, we've received uh, our first uh, evolution of, of funds. We're grateful for the Indiana Finance Authority. They are our uh, SRF uh, administrator within the state of Indiana uh, that provided us with both a grant and a loan opportunity. But it's just, you know, a piece of the broader puzzle. Uh, we would not have enough investment to get this done in accordance with uh, federal requirements if it was if we stood by and waited for those dollars to flow. So it's it's about bringing our private investment. Obviously, we've done one hundred million dollars. We're, we're going to continue to advocate and and uh, apply for federal loan and grant grant opportunities. And at the end of the day, I think the affordability question is one that has to be raised. And for Indiana, we've got a, and other, every other state in, on this call is probably weighing it as well. We've got a, other emerging um, investment needs, PFOS and other things that are competing for our investment dollar, regardless of what the interest, the earnings, the return, all that. There is tremendous investment required in our utilities, just in the aged infrastructure. When we think about economic development and projects to bring water uh, to those you know, new job creators, but also then the emerging contaminants that we're treating both on the lead or uh, cryptosporidium or other things with other treatment requirements. So a lot of being th things are being done. And I think Indiana's tried to strike the balance and say, look, we're not going to, to play uh, the game of who, which dollar goes to where. We, we want to make sure all dollars have access to, to the appropriate return. And Indiana, we return, get a return of and on for our lead service program so that we are consistently investing where the need is for that, that, that cycle in that year. So, and we're proud to be able to do that on an annualized basis. So we had a question. Um, 
about um, fairness to customers of larger wa water companies that have to bear the cost of lead replacement associated with new acquisitions. So you acquire a new system, might be distressed, um, so they have lots of issues. So needing investment, now you've got PFOS, and we had lead service lines. Um, what is the fairness of these larger companies having to take over these smaller systems, which require a lot of investment for many reasons, and that the existing customers have to pay for that? What do you think about that? Anyone? I, I, would, I would say it's, it really is something for the utility commissions to weigh in on the fairness, right? And his legal question, but I would also postulate, is it fair for the taxpayers of that county and that state and in the United States to supplement uh, the bailout of a community system that refused to invest in their infrastructure for decades? The money will come from somewhere. Um, so the fairness question is, is, you know, you can look at it from a very narrow perspective or a much broader perspective. But if that community is failing and they need a water supply that's safe, um, there will the money will have to come from somewhere, whether it's a private utility uh, spreading that out or it's going to be coming through uh, other taxes and other other costs at the at the public level. Uh, there's no free lunch uh, out there. So the question is, what is the best method of doing that? And that's where the utility commissions come in to make that fairness decision. Yeah, I'll jump in as well. I, I think, you know, the fairness is certainly one that's it's a reasonable question to ask. And for me, fairness is about I should be able to go as, as a resident of Indiana to any community in Indiana and receive water of a similar quality that's safe and reliable. Um, if, if I can't do that, then, then the state and the utilities in that jurisdiction have done us a disservice. Now, we know that when you do acquisitions, you're inheriting uh, what I'll say, historical political decisions may be favorable or not favorable, depending on that that acquisition scenario. Uh, we've had acquisitions that had nothing to do with lead, that had manganese and iron, and and there were, had consistent brown water events. You know, we we invested to, to treat those systems to solve that problem, and uh, for Indiana, largely our rate payers across the state pay at area one rate, um, and, and so we're able to blend that. But that being said, we've been here for 135 years. And I serve communities like Richmond, Indiana, that got a new UV disinfection uh, treatment facility a few years ago. And that cost as well is spread across our entire uh, rate based customers across the state. So, you know, I think the problems themselves are maybe different from one community to the next, but all communities require investment ongoing. Uh, it may be your year to get some lead replaced. It may be another community is to deal with uh, some other uh, treatment activities. So to me, that's fairness. I should be able to drive anywhere within the state that's under the jurisdiction of our commission and receive a water quality that gives me the confidence to be able to consume that as a consumer. So when I read the news, I see really high numbers about having to treat for PFOS or PFOA. Can you put in perspective a comparison of what we're going to have to expend for PFOS and PFOA and the lead service lines? Are they close? Far apart? One's going to be a lot less? Well, I, you know, uh, let's look at the lawsuit settlements from 3M and DuPont. They add up to about $12.5 billion. And we know that those are pennies on the dollar of what's actually required. There's been studies out there by Minnesota that they're saying it's going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. The federal funding is no, it's only authorized through the upcoming year or two, is only in a couple billion dollars. So we know that PFAS costs for water utilities across the country combined are on the order of magnitude, at least, of lead service line replacement and, and those infrastructure upgrades. Now, we also know that in the United States that our water infrastructure is, uh, based on the, late, on the latest studies, is several trillion dollars behind in needed upgrades and catch-up work. So, um, it's it's another big piece of a uh, piece of weight to put on the back of of a system that's already taxed uh, in terms of trying to catch up on infrastructure, but it is work that needs to get done, and uh, they're both important and both valuable, and uh, we want to make sure that we're making progress on both equally, 
and fairly. So when you come in for rate increases, um, because you have all these projects, you have aging infrastructure, you have now PFOS, and you have level service lines. Uh, that's a lot of money. So rates will be impacted. And what kind of uh, customer outreach and explanations that happen um, when you're in for a rate case? So that the consumers can kind of can understand what's going on. Mr. you want me to take that or do you want to take that? Oh, I'll <laughs> jump in there. <laughs> you can take the, the back end of it, but I'm basically gonna say, you know, when when there is a rate case to go on, of course there's rate case meetings, right? So there's open town rate case meetings at certain at certain locations, each town, where the residents can come out voice their opinion you have rate case folks out there that that also uh maintain and, and uh make sure that there's fairness to be to be brought out to the current rate payers in mind so there is a ton of outreach when it comes to that and then you know it's education also so it's not just one-sided yeah and i'll add it you know, I don't know who all is our audience today, but, you know, water is the only utility we ingest. It, That's it's right. A critical nature. Um, and I'm not saying that, that that ties directly to some monetary evaluation, but we do have to put it uh, in its rightful place as a country, as a, as a people, um, when we think about its priority to our lives and our livelihood. Um, that being said, I know for many of the states uh, where we have utilities on the call, you know, we're, we're advocating for, for federal assistance programs from uh, the federal government was a live walk program during the uh, last couple of years post COVID that has since expired. We continue to advocate for that continuation, similar to what we have in this country for lie heap uh, for the gas customers. I know for many of our States, we have low income programs or are working with our commissions to develop uh, assistance programs for folks that, that may be of need. And I know even for our fixed income, um, low volume users in Indiana. One thing that we just received from our commission in our most recent rate case was a fixed charge, 1,500 gallons. If you can manage your consumption, um, maybe you're a, a, a you know grandmother, a grandfather by yourself, whatever the case may be, but you're not a big user, you're not watering your lawn, you're not filling a pool. If you can manage that cost, you know you're going to have a $20 fixed bill uh, month to month. And so giving people that ability to manage their own budgets and their consumption, I think, is important. And then, of course, for Indiana, we look to have some sort of affordability program in the future. Uh, as we were working through our last rate case, we had a proposal, and we continue to, to work that with the commission and the other advocates. I have, a, I, I have an observation. Um, I attended a National Association of Water Companies, one of their summits, and I forget which utility provided this, but I thought it was a great visual. And they actually put a dollar bill up and they divided it up between like capital investment and such. And so a citizen can see where, when they pay a dollar, how much of that goes to what parts of the cost of this, of the utility. Um, have any of you seen that sort of? I, I, that may be from our, one of our engineering leads. He, he, he's got a similar slide. I don't know if it was his. Yes. Uh, it definitely balances out. You got to be thinking about resiliency. You know, is the system resilient long term? Are we thinking about uh, the emerging contaminants, the PFAS, the other things we've talked about yeah. today? Um, and, and then I, I'll go to for for a lot of our communities, economic development. How do we partner with our communities to make sure that they're they have a, the supply that they need long term for that growth? All those things have to be managed and, and kind of um, prioritized uh, as you would expect in that investment dollar that the consumer is giving us. Now, I remember when we were discussing this earlier um, on another day, um, that there's some benefit when lines are being replaced, where now maybe people investing in homes and purchasing and uh, renovating homes and neighborhoods. Have you seen that? Yeah, I, I think I'm hinted on it earlier too, but uh, we, we definitely are seeing that, and especially in our more economically distressed areas where the home values are suppressed um, than what we'd probably like to see. And it's it's just one more uh, investment that is now taking that property and say, okay, this is an investment that a developer would not have to replace. 
um, especially as this rule becomes more permanent in our lives and, and maybe disclosed, they're able to then flip that property, make some investment and then sell it. And of course, the property value itself went from virtually nothing because that home might have been sitting up for tax sale and now is being occupied by a resident with the infrastructure to support that home long ongoing. And so now it's a tax base add on to that community. So we talked about, you talked about a customer assistance program. What, you know, we know about line walk, <laughs> um, and then there's some customer assistance programs within the utilities themselves. Is this gonna be a different type of assistance program or is it going to be administered like uh, the program to help with paying bills? Hey, we have a program, uh, we do this, uh, we had several of them this year. So basically we have all the utilities are there. It's sponsored by the board of public utilities, but all the utilities are out there to help out um, Residents can come there, they fill out the applications, they get any help and support they need for their services. And it's not just water, you know, electrics there, gas, uh, home energy, uh, all that different factors are there and involved. So it's a great outreach program that we do for the residents. So it sounds like it's a one-stop shop and they don't have to keep going from- Exactly. And all the people are there to help you through that application, which can sometimes be the hardest thing you got to do is to fill out that application. So it's a great program that we've been doing and um, looking forward to, uh, we have another one coming up shortly uh, next month. So that's our plan to continue these on yearly. Are those electronically available online for people who are- Yes, you can check on, and our, other... on our website too and see that, yep. And if someone needs more help, they can come to a particular office? Yes, call in and we'll, we'll get you in the right direction. Anyone else have a view on your customer assistance program? I, I mean, I was going to specifically answer on, uh, you know, not every state has it set up perfectly um, where the utility is going to be doing the work on the customer's property and the customer just has to sign. We've seen uh, variations in other states where the customer, you know, we help you, the utility would help the customer apply for a grant to pay for the line replacement, or there's a variety of variations on that. The most popular and considered the most efficient out there from a lot of these being done is really letting the utility coordinate with one contractor on that street to get the best price for a lot of people instead of one-offs and getting all the work done in one shot and getting everybody safely uh, protected. And then the utility working out how to, to uh, deal with those costs and putting that burden on the average homeowner because uh, as a, if anybody's ever you know tried to get anything done at their home with working with government, especially even just an energy improvement project, uh, the coordination effort is, is, and paperwork is, is a lot, even for most people, and, um, you know, imagine working with uh, a retired person or somebody that works two jobs that just doesn't have time for this. Uh, it could be overwhelming. So, uh, but we've seen variations on those themes out there. So, yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh. So, maybe you pick a street, <laughs> a block or so, and that's going to be the one you're targeting. Is that where you knock on doors, do flyers? Yeah. Um, and try to get that all set up for when you're ready to come in and do the work. Definitely. It's an outreach program. We, we first sit down with the town hall, the committees, the council folks. Then we do a, uh, you know, a mailer. Then we do a knock at the door where you'll get a uh, pamphlet dropped off to you and a number where you can reach out to. And we'll explain the program. We'll come back out. And we need to get your sign off on this to get those access agreements so we can perform that work. Um, so that's one of the biggest things is, is working with the towns because, you know, we, we, we need to get with them to make sure that they know what's going on inside their town. It's, it's a big communication uh, for us in the past when I was at the water company. Yeah, that's an important distinction is that the utility asset, and I know the commissioner talked about it earlier, ends at the meter. Um, obviously, we're asking the 
the consumer to give us, grant us access to their property. We're going to tear up flower beds. We're going to probably tear up sidewalks. We may deploy different technologies if we can to, to limit that cost, whatever the, the, the most prudent uh, expense from that perspective is. But at the end of the day, we're coming onto their personal property, uh, working with that customer, and then restoring it back to, uh, to, to, to its you know original utilization, uh, flower bed or whatever it may have been. And then we're, I think most utilities or the contractors doing that work are going to warranty that line for maybe a year. I know that's what it is for our contractors in Indiana. They'll warranty that. And then of course, that asset is now owned again by the customer long term. So if there's a leak along that line beyond that year, it would be back to that customer's responsibility uh, to, to repair that down the road. So, And, and uh, you know, there are variations on these depending on the state you're in and what's happening. Uh, a, a good example is in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, if you're doing a main replacement program and you're trying to pull the lead service lines out as you go and replace or not pull them out, but replace uh, the lines with with other connections that are not led. Uh, we're actually required under Act 120 uh, that if the customer does not respond after multiple attempts while we're doing the main replacement, we're not allowed to leave a partial lead service line in the street. We actually are required under law to issue a shutoff notice, and we will shut that person's water off. It may not be perfect, but what we've seen is. We've seen people that are completely unresponsive and they get that 10 day shutoff notice and within 24 hours, the paperwork signed and that lead service line is getting uh, taken offline and they're getting a clean source of water. Uh, uh, and it was a, a pretty bold move on, on the account of the state, uh, but it's actually been an incredibly effective tool at preventing uh, these partial lead service lines that we don't wanna have out there. Anyone else had any legislative fixes that they are aware of? Specifically to the uh, non-responsive, uh, and I won't even call it, you know, it may not be your direct customer. Your direct customer may be a tenant, and so maybe a landlord. That's where we've had problems. Indi like I said earlier, Indiana passed a bill this session specifically to address, sounds very similar uh, to what Pennsylvania had uh, previously uh, put into statute as well, so. Now we talked about if you don't have those laws in place and someone just refuses, um, that there might be a requirement in the future about you have to disclose that if you're selling your home. I, I don't believe we anyone knew of any state that has gone that route yet. Is that correct? No, not, not at this point that I know of, but I would give to give you a better example is let, let's look at a an oil tank replacement as an example, right? So mm -hmm. I'm selling my home, I had an oil tank there, I switched over to gas, you know, right now it, in New Jersey, you have to remove that tank and if the ground dirt has to be sampled and tested and everything's gotta come back with a clear bell of health before you can change hands of that home. So that's one of the biggest things. I don't know if they'll get there as far as the services are concerned, but anybody that's smart enough buying a home today would really know that the, for one of the things they should do on their home inspection is make sure the water line is checked, you know, so that they can verify has that work been done. Or, and then also contact a little water, water company to see what the water company has on their side also. So um, and, very simple to do. Well, and also one of the new requirements under the lead cover rule revisions and lead cover rule improvements is many systems over a certain size are required to make a publicly facing map. And we're supposed to, even for smaller systems, make this information the commissioner mentioned available in the, under the coming regulations. So if we if we have a, we would have a map of your neighborhood, say in some of these larger systems, where there's a circle and it looks like two sides of a half side of a moon, right? One side's gonna be colored, once one color or cross hatched to designate one type of material, the other side would be colored to designate what that is. And then there may be another color that indicates we don't know. But three, four years from now, almost all of those are going to be filled in. So if you think about it, five in four or five years from now, you go to buy or sell a house, that information is going to be online, whether it's on a map or you'll be able to quickly find out from your local utility. So it's not like it's going to be difficult to know. And with that information being required to be available and be out there, 
I think a lot of savvy home inspectors are, are going to be using that as as a as an important uh, as an important tool in there. So we have a question. They, the question is 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 it required that customer led service lines have to be removed, or could just a new line be laid to serve the property so that the current lead line isn't disturbed? So do, would you leave the lead line in the soil and just Put a new line in to connect. Yes, we. I mean, for New Jersey, they were moving over or sending a new line out. Where we weren't removing that line, the old service line there that would have abandoned in place. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think it probably depends on the location and what you're already doing. I and mean, if you're if you're doing an open cut and you're already going to tear into the area where the old existing line was, we, we do see them getting pulled out quite regularly just so that it's not there. If you're not doing that, maybe you're boring because you're trying to keep the cost of the replacement down. Um, that's where you're going to have it in place in, in those circumstances. Oh, good. So, um, The EPA process, um, I know they get a lot of comments, but uh, was there a great deal of talk with utilities and about setting these got these deadlines and the feasibility of the deadlines? Yeah, there were both both the lead copper rule revisions and lead copper rule improvements. I mean, they go they go way back. There was National Drinking Water uh, Advisory Council meetings back in the in the 2010s, right? They're, the revising these rules has been a conversation since the early 2000s. Uh, and it was really, you know, what and how and, and where, who was gonna make money available, right? And, and I think uh, technically everybody got to the point where, yeah, we need to get rid of these lead service lines. The government said, well, we're gonna try to make some money available to help utilities. Um, and then it really came down to, well, how do we do this? Uh, it is a big lift going door to door to door. What's a reasonable timeline to get it done? You know, how will we deal with special issues and exceptions that will inevitably come about? And and those were a lot of hard conversations, right? And everybody and, and you know, just like 50 states, you know, in every state, every community has things a little differently. You know, everybody, everybody was trying to come up with something that worked and there is no one size fits all. Uh, and I assume there's, you know, it's really going to come down to the states that administer these programs now. And what we're seeing is every state administers differently and has a different focus based on the different priorities in that state. Uh, and some some have a, a different priority than others, uh, and some are very prescriptive and some are very general. And so we're going to see this evolve. But in the end, you know, I think we all know that you know, the, the first 90% is easy, it's the last 10% that's hard. And I think we're gonna make a lot of progress here in the next couple of years. And, you know, the reg will have achieved a, a large piece of its goal. Um, it's that last remaining cleanup that'll be the, the, the next time to get to. But by and large, I think the last 20 years, utilities and regulators have spent a lot of time to hem, uh, discussing and hammering out the what ifs and the, and the what could be's and how would we uh, and I think we've gotten a pretty decent idea of that. Everyone might disagree uh, a little bit on some of the endpoints and a little bit on the house, but by and large, um, this is the best, best, best process we can come up with to get at this issue. Uh, short of spending another spending another twenty years talking about it, it's time to get something done. Yeah, I would say that the kind of the thought leadership around uh, the, some of the policies, certainly the various organizations that that we all participate in, American Water Works, National Association of Water Companies are trying to give, you know, what we believe to be reasonable time frames for reasonable investment, thinking about affordability and, and the like. Uh, the consumer wants these things done as they become more and more educated on them, their expectation for executing and getting these uh, risks out of our water system are actually going to be very, very paramount in their minds. I think we see that communities are already impacted directly by it, um, but those that aren't, and I know we've hinted that there are those that probably haven't even started on their programs or are very early in their their, their program development, that's going, that, that earnest is going to get uh, to a point of, of no return where, where public leaders 
whether it's city officials, regulators, whatever the stakeholder is, is going to understand one, the risk and two, the opportunities to, to get it done. But certainly the cost impacts are gonna be weighed along the way and, and hopefully there'll be additional resources uh, as we've already seen, uh, whether it's from the federal government or others uh, to, to try to create an appetite and a, and a desire to get these done. I just think to add to that, just one concern that I that I had saw is that I believe it in EPA, there, there are estimates on the cost of replacements were, were off, completely off. They didn't figure in all the other advocates, you know, uh, engineering, internal uh, permitting, customer outreach, I, I, all these factors weren't included in their estimates. And, and the other thing is, you know, material costs, materials are going up, you know, uh, supply chain issues, another big thing that's out there and we have to contend with, uh, you know, so these are the things, you know, depth of service, how deep is that service line? These are things that were not even considered, I think, when they did their estimating costs. So this is something that uh, uh, we have to look out for. So I noticed in a lot of states, there are a lot of articles, news articles about schools and daycares. And I was curious if any of you with the utilities prioritize like dealing with schools and daycares where they may be located first in yeah, your prioritization. For, for Indiana, Early in the, when we, the state kind of authorized the program, there was also a testing requirement. At that time, it was actually administered by both uh, our environmental regulator in the state, but also our Indiana Finance Authority. They helped fund it, and you went out to every school. Now, obviously, under the new uh, revised rule, you know the utilities have an obligation to identify and test at those sites. So I think that'll be an ongoing concern. Probably the one that kind of concerns me is on the daycares. It, we don't always know where a daycare is because it may be an in-home asset or something that's maybe not as obvious. So that's going to become where the customer and those, those facilities are going to have to work with us as utility providers to make sure that they're on our list and that we're doing the adequate testing to ensure them. Now, it goes back to, to, to our treatment processes, our, our uh, anti-corrosive activities and all the things we're doing to make us a well-run utility. If we're doing those things, that shouldn't be a problem, but definitely something we're going to have to keep on the fore end. All right. I want to give each one of you a closing a statement. Um, it's three minutes till we're done. And I think it'd be good to kind of wrap up thoughts from each one of you. And Matt, you're on my big screen. So I think you're it. That may be frightening. Well, I'll be <laughs> brief, but I would just say that if you know of a utility that's not started, uh, they need to have encouragement from local uh, well, the units of government, customer groups, uh, stakeholders to really drive it. Uh, so if this is something that's not been the topic of your community, start asking uh, those good questions. I know we can provide a lot of great materials from American Water, you know, those customer uh, pamphlets, the education materials, all that's public information. Uh, this is a, an opportunity for best practices. So we're happy to share that with anyone that uh, has an interest in, in a community you may be looking at. I, I guess I'll go quickly. You know, I, I know we're talking about lead and PFAS and all these things that are scary. Uh, and, you know, we do have investments to make to keep our infrastructure strong in the United States. But uh, even though the perception may be that your drinking water has all these hazards, it's never been safer than it's, it's been right now. We're just continuing to move the ball forward to make it safer. Uh, but the perception is not necessarily uh, close to where the reality lies. And so, you know, one of the things we're going to have to do a better job moving forward with all this work is making sure people understand there's some, some sense of confidence in their water utilities and in their water quality, and that these investments are to build confidence, not to perceive a, a lack of confidence. Yeah, I have to agree uh, with the team here. Um, you know, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for making me be a part of this today. Uh, getting my opportunity, but I would just say is, uh, you know, for the water companies out there, please continue to communicate to your folks and your customers, and for the customers out there, please get involved. Uh, there's enough information out there that you should know what's going on in your neighborhood, in your area, and don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody if you're not sure, you know, and you know what? 
please sign these access agreements to let the water companies in to, to replace your lines. We, we depend on you, the, the homeowner. So I'll give that one last charge off to, to these all. And Michael, I think I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, thank you for moderating today. And thank you, Commissioner Bange and Chris and Matt for being on our panel today. This has been a great conversation, raising a lot of questions, uh, maybe more questions than answers in some respects, but that's kind of where we are in this process, I think, uh, along with all the other changes coming down the pipe in the water area. Uh, no pun intended, I guess. Um, but uh, I certainly want to thank you for your time today. I also want to thank those who tuned in today to participate or to, to uh, hear or, or watch the webinar and those that ask questions. You know, FRI has several programs going on. In fact, we have an advanced seminar on pricing with a track on water at the end of the month. I think we might still be able to get a couple of registrations in for that if you're interested in that advanced seminar on how do we actually pay for all this stuff and how do we structure prices in a way that is sensitive to the ability of consumers to pay as well as is sensitive to the needs of covering the costs. Um, you can learn more about that program at our website, fri.missouri.edu, as well as our other programs we have coming up later in the year. So thank you all again for your time today. We'll have this recording up on YouTube within another day or so if you want to come back and relive this experience. And um, we hope to see you again at one of our future programs. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care now.